Welcome to Exodus. Uh, it's, it's great to have you. We are currently in our series on the story of Elijah. And thus far, this story has been one of excitement. And it's been an action-packed story. Uh, the, the, the character of Elijah, in my opinion, is actually um, a far more intriguing character than most of uh, the superheroes in movies or the heroes we hear about in uh, books or comic books and so on. Uh, Elijah is one of those guys that when we read, we just can't help but be impressed with, right? We cannot, be, cannot help but be impressed with his boldness and his character, uh, the power in which he uh, conducts himself before the enemies of God, so this morning, uh, we are going to be in the next part of the story of Elijah, which is in chapter 18, the last part of chapter 18. Um, but before we get in that, just a little bit of context. What's happened in, in, up to this point in the story is important because in our passage this morning, things slow down just a little bit. All right, they slow down just a little bit. And, and what we're going to see this morning is how the story of Elijah uh, fits within the Bible as a whole and how the story of Elijah actually just tells us uh, the same sort of story that the Bible tells us over and over again. All right, so up to this point, we have been uh, following Elijah through the wilderness and Sidon. He, was, he, he came to Sidon where he stayed with a widow and he provided her with oil and flour to make bread. Uh, and that oil and flour would never run out. And then we see uh, the, the woman's son dying and Elijah stepping in and praying to God and beseeching God and saying, God, how could you let this happen? D don't take this woman's child, her only son. She's a widow and this is the only one that she has. God, how could you possibly take this boy after all she's done for your servant? So Elijah prays three times that God would bring this boy back from the dead and the spirit of God comes and brings the boy back to life and he carries her down carries him down and gives it gives him to his mother uh, and to which she then has utmost confidence in God she goes now I believe that the words that come out of your mouth are true now I believe Yahweh is the true God and you have to remember that she has been raised and lives in Sidon and Sidon is the place where Baal worship uh, is at its highest. It is the hub of Baal. In fact, the idea that Baal actually resides in Sidon. And we know who came out of Sidon and went to Israel is Jezebel. And Jezebel came to Israel and married King Ahab. And because of this marriage and Ahab's spineless character, he allows Jezebel to insert Baal worship. And now all of Israel is running after Baal. And God, as he's promised in the scriptures, when his people go to worship other gods and are unfaithful to the covenant, there will be problems. There will be curses on the people if you do not live faithfully to the covenant. And in the same way, if you live faithfully, God has promised to bless you and take care of you. So Israel is now worshiping Baal. And Elijah shows up before he goes to Sidon and lays a curse on Israel, saying, there will be no rain or dew or water in the land until my word is spoken. So then he goes to Sidon, he lives with the widow, and then the word of the Lord comes back to Elijah, says, okay, it's time. Three and a half years later, it's time to go back to Israel, back to Ahab and Jezebel, and confront the prophets of Baal, and bring rain back to the land. So uh, Elijah comes back, he confronts the prophet of Baal, which we looked at last week, how it was Yahweh versus Baal, it was Elijah versus 450 prophets, and the prophets of Baal set up their altar and prayed that Baal would send fire down to consume the altar, yet all day, Baal is silent. Baal says nothing. Baal is powerless to show up when they really needed him. And this competition that they had, Elijah versus the prophet of Baal, Yahweh versus Baal himself, that it was a high stakes competition, right? I mean, at the end of the day, if your God doesn't show up, you're done. In fact, we, this is where we pick up our story is Elijah 
brings the 400, and pro- 400 prophets of Baal a- after God consumes the altar with fire so hot that it melts the bone, it evaporates the water, it, gets complete, it, it, it even evaporates the rocks. Elijah put 12 stones in this altar, and the fire was so intense that the rocks themselves became as nothing. Nothing was left. And when that happened, it was the end of the day for the 400 prof- 450 prophets of Baal. A deal is a deal. That it's time for them to die. So Elijah tells Israel, gather them and bring them down to the valley of Kishon. And Elijah himself goes down and slaughters the 450 prophets of Baal. Now what we see happening at this point in the story is that this story is only halfway done. This story is not yet complete. So we're going to complete it this morning and see how God renews covenant with his people. And when God renews covenant, we also see that there is a new creation. It's a new day for Israel. So if you would, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. And we're going to start in verses 41 through 46. It says this. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of rushing rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. And he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the seas. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, This is his servant speaking. Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up. Say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind. And there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Let's pray. God, I pray for uh, our time this morning. God, I pray that your word would move forward and encourage your people. God, may you be glorified this morning. May we be impressed with you. And may we recognize the new creation that you you are creating even now in Christ through your people. In your name we pray. Amen. So here we have Elijah having just slaughtered the 400 prophets, 450 prophets of Baal. Blood still on his hands. And he looks to Ahab and he says, go up, eat and drink. So Ahab obeys, as most people do when Elijah speaks to them. Ahab obeys. He climbs up out of this Kishon Valley where there's 450 slaughtered false prophets. And he goes up back to where the altars were. And he eats and he drinks. And this is important because this is the conclusion of a covenant renewal. When God is doing a work with his people, when God calls them to repent, when God shows up, his glory is manifested, and the people of God turn from one direction, repent, and start going toward God, God then invites them to come and eat and drink. And this is incredible because Ahab is a scumbag. He's awful. I mean, the the book of Kings tells us he's the worst king Israel had ever seen. Yet, this is the grace of God, that even someone like Ahab is able to be a part of this covenant renewal. If you remember, the the sins of Israel were laid upon the altar, represented in those 12 stones and the 12 buckets of water and the cut up bowl. And when the fire came down upon that altar, we see that it It satisfies God's justice and God's wrath. Therefore, Elijah is able to say to Ahab, go up, eat and drink. It is a new day. However, Elijah continues up the mountain. He goes all the way up to the top of Mount Carmel. And if we remember all the way back in uh, chapter 17, verse 1, also in chapter 18, verse 1, we see that the main reason Elijah came back to Israel is to bring rain, not just to kill the prophets of Baal, but to bring rain back to the land. 
However, for this to happen, the people must repent of their unfaithfulness. They are living in a, in, in a life of unfaithfulness underneath the curse of God, thus living within the drought. So for, for rain to come, they must repent, and this is what we see happening. You see, in God's covenantal economy, he instituted both blessings and curses within the covenant. If you are faithful to the covenant, you will be blessed. If you're unfaithful to the covenant, you will be cursed. And this is what they have been suffering from for three and a half years, the curse of their unfaithfulness. And you see, rain and crops are symbolic of God's blessing to his people. And Moses actually warns that this will happen in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. It says this, Moses speaking to Israel, calling them to be faithful. Don't be unfaithful, be faithful, right? And this is what he says. Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside to serve other gods and worship them. Then, if that happens, Israel, listen to me, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. You know, there's a part of me that wants to say, come on, Israel. Like, th this, is, this is written out in black and white for you, right? If you serve other gods, there will be no rain for you. If you serve other gods, you will be cursed. There will be famine, there will be drought, there will be pain, there will be sorrow and suffering. Israel, what, what don't you understand about this? You know, you would think after even a couple weeks without rain and crops begin to wither, uh, Israel would say, oh, shoot, we're, we're serving Baal. And Moses told us if we do this, he's going to keep rain from us. So if we want to have rain, we need to get right with God, essentially. Yet, Israel's hard-heartedness prevailed. They would not turn their heart. They were incapable of turning their hearts to God. In the same way, we are incapable of turning our hearts to God unless God comes in and acts on us. And this is what he does with Elijah, sending Elijah to Israel to call them to repent. So we see, again, that they are clearly disobedient, unfaithful people, deserving of the covenant. So the defeat of Baal and his prophets was only step one in renewing this covenant, right? If they're going to be in right relationship with God, if their hard hearts are going to be turned, then God has to show up and get rid of the idol on behalf of the people because they are incapable of doing it themselves. So he sends Elijah and destroys Baal destroys the prophets of Baal. Now, now they can receive the blessing. Now the whole point of Elijah coming to Israel is about to take place. Rain is about to come back. Everything's about to change for the people. So the defeat of Baal and his prophets, again, only step one, the people are still starving. They're still struggling because of the drought. Israel themselves have been renewed. However, creation itself must also be renewed. You see, there's an interesting interplay with God and his creation. And we see this throughout the Bible that our relationship to God is not just about us individually or even us corporately, but the promises of God go beyond us to all creation itself. So creation itself must likewise be renewed. Look again at verse 42. It says this, Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself on the earth and put his face between his knees. Here, Elijah takes the posture of worship as he prays to God. He bows down. He lays himself down over the dead earth, over this earth that has no life in it, and he prays to God to send life back into the earth. You see, the curse of sin not only affects humanity, but it affects creation itself. Since sin entered the world, creation itself has been suffering under the, its curse and under its bondage, decaying, yet waiting along with the people of God for God to redeem it. God is about the holistic redemption of his created order, not just individuals, but creation itself is longing for redemption. Paul helps us understand this in Romans 8, 19 through 23. He says this, For creation waits with eager longings for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For creation, likewise with humanity, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption, obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons and the redemption of our bodies. So what Paul is telling the church is it's not just humanity that longs for the ultimate redemption, but creation itself is going to be completely redeemed. There will be a new creation that is coming, and this is our hope, and we see this all throughout the Bible, a hope of a new day, a new creation, and we see pictures of this new creation and this new day all throughout the stories of the Bible. So creation joins humanity, longing, hoping, groaning for that day when it will be redeemed, renewed, and restored, and put back in right relationship with God. So when Israel repented, they were renewed in the covenant, but now the earth itself must be renewed. Look at verses 43 through 44 of 1 Kings 18. It says this, and he said to his servant, this is Elijah speaking, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stops you. So here we have Elijah moving from one order of business to another, right? He just conquers the prophets of Baal and Baal himself. And he goes and climbs up to the very top of the mountain, takes his servant with him, with him and he lies down again on this dead earth and prays that God would bring life back into the dry, dusty soil of the earth. This, this earth that is unable to feed the crops and unable to provide water, this earth that is essentially dead, it mirrored Israel's apostasy. It mirrored Israel's hardness of heart and the hardness of the soil. So Elijah lays himself out over the earth and prays to God for rain to come back. And he tells his servant, he says, go look over the sea. So I'm guessing on the top of Mount Carmel, if you were up there, you could, you could move around, and there's, there's uh, one direction you can look, and you can see the sea. And he tells them, go, go look over the sea and tell me what you see. So the servant goes, he looks, he comes back, goes, I don't see anything. Elijah, still laying on the ground, says, go again. He goes again, comes back, I don't see anything. And seven times this happens, back and forth. And finally, on the seventh, he sees something. He sees a cloud that looked kind of like a man's palm or a fist rising up over the water. Literally, the idea is it is ascending. It's ascending over the water and hovering over the water, this cloud. And it makes sense to us why Elijah would tell his servant to go look over the sea as opposed to going and looking down the mountain or looking up into the sky. He says, go look over the waters. Because Elijah knows that when God brings about a new creation, he does so through water. This has been the story from the beginning, even in creation. In Genesis 1, we see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. And it is from that scenario that God begins to speak creation into existence. We see when God recreated the world the second time, he does so out of the waters of the flood. We also see that when God created his own people, a people for himself, Egypt, he does so by bringing them through the waters. We see this even picked up in the Gospel of John in the New Testament. When Nicodemus asks Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life, to have the, the kingdom of God? And Jesus tells him, you have to be born of spirit and water. Because it's always through water that new birth comes. So it makes sense for us when we read this story that Elijah is telling his servant to go look over the water. So he comes back the seventh time and finally he says, I, I see a cloud. It's a small cloud. It looks just kind of like a hand that's floating above the water. And this is what Elijah had been praying for 
for God to come and renew creation by sending rain. And this little cloud hovering over the water was God's answer that a renewed creation is coming. Now this passage in the story of Elijah, again, it kind of slows down from the excitement of the prophets of Baal. Yet this passage here is packed full of symbolic meaning that is so important for us to grasp, to understand this story, and to understand the, the beauty of God and even how this story fits within the Bible as a whole. So I want to take just a few minutes and, and, and show you, and I, I don't want us to move past this without seeing what God is doing in this passage symbolically. So look with me, if you would, at verse 42 again. Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of the mountain, uh, and he bowed himself down on the earth. He put his face between his knees. The Hebrew verb for bow down only shows up in one other passage in all the Bible. One other passage. And that's in 2 Kings chapter 4. And it's the story of Elijah's disciple, Elisha. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 32 through 35 says this. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child laying dead on his bed. So he went in, shut the door behind the two of them, uh, and, and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he, right here this word, stretched himself out. He stretched himself upon him. And his flesh, and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and again stretched himself upon him the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes so when we read stretch twice in this passage those are the only other usage of this word that describes elijah bowing down or stretching himself out on the earth so we see elisha going up and there is this dead boy on the bed and he prays to God. And the way in which he does that is he stretches himself out over the boy, praying that God would bring life back into this dead boy. And he does it twice. Pr stretches himself out, praying, God, bring this boy back. And life came back into the boy. First, his flesh gets warm. And then he sneezes seven times. Kind of an interesting little tidbit there. Uh, why do we want to know about the sneezing habits of this boy? Well, I think it's important because he sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. So we have Elijah stretching himself out over the earth. We have Elisha stretching himself out over this dead child. Elisha prays. The boy comes back to life and sneezes seven times. Elijah stretches, uh, stretched out over the dead earth, prays. And tells his servant to go back and forth how many times? Seven times. And then on the seventh, we see hope. We see a picture of new creation. We see that God is going to fulfill his promise and bring the earth back to life in the same way he brought this boy back to life. And as we know, the number seven represents creation. The seven days of creation. When we see this number seven throughout the Bible, it represents most often a new order, a new creation, a new day. God is working. So we see that Elijah's posture even represents new creation. But it's not just his posture, nor the number seven that brings about this imagery of the new creation. But we also see... Uh, what Elijah tells his servant is likewise significant. He tells him seven times to go and look. And when his servant comes back, he says this, I see a cloud hovering over the water. Look with me at verse 44. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. Again, literally would be, um, it, it would be hovering or hovering over or ascending from the sea. And he said, go up, tell Ahab, prepare the chariot, go down, lest the rain stop you. The servant sees a cloud rising from the sea. All throughout the Bible, we see the spirit of God and the glory of God are manifested 
in the cloud. The servants, uh, the servant sees the cloud rising from the sea, and Elijah has full confidence that this is not just a cloud, but this is a picture of the glory of God and the Spirit of God. We see that God is represented in the cloud so often in the Bible. And this is a powerful thing for us to remember. That even as we look around, God is testifying about himself in creation constantly. I think perhaps one of the best uh, verses that talk about God being in the cloud, this glory cloud, is in Exodus 24, 16. It says this, the glory of the Lord dwelt on, my, on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Again, in 1 Kings 8, chapter 11, it says this, So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This glory cloud is also the same cloud that led Israel out of Egypt into the new creation in the Exodus story. Exodus 13, 21 says this, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, to lead them among the way, and by night in the pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The Exodus was likewise a new creation as they came through the waters, with the cloud hovering over them. In fact, in Deuteronomy 32, Moses makes this connection about the pillar of cloud that hovered over Israel as they came through the waters in the Exodus, and connects it to Genesis 1-2 with the Spirit of God hovering over the waters in creation. Genesis 1-2 says the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. All right, so that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of references. Let me try to, to wrap that up, okay? In this story of Elijah, there is something really powerful going on here. There's something very powerful within the story and how it fits in the, in the history of redemption overall. All right? You have Elijah, again, stretched out over this dead earth, praying that God would bring life back into it. And on the seventh time, representing creation, Elijah's servant sees a cloud hovering over the waters. This glory cloud and this arrangement of cloud and water represents the new creation. It's a new day for the people of God. It's a new day for Elijah and for Ahab and for uh, all of Israel who had been in bondage to Baal, had been in bondage to false worship. In the same way that Israel was in bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt, and it took a cloud that led them through the waters for them to have a new creation, a new day, to have freedom. So this is happening again in the life of Elijah and for the people of God. This is one of those stories for us when we think about the cross of Christ and how his spirit comes down upon us and empowers us and moves us from bondage to slavery. I mean, from bondage to freedom, from slavery to a new day, a new identity, right? It is, it is a picture of Jesus' redemptive work. Paul says that if you believe in Christ, you are a new creation in Christ. You have been a part of this story. So this story of, of new creation is not only one that gives Israel hope in the days of Elijah, but it's also a story that shows us the faithfulness of God and how even though sin corrupts, sin corrupts our, our, our lives, our days, it corrupts creation. And each week we, we struggle as we come through the week trying to live faithfully for God. And what we have is a new creation, a covenant renewal each week when we come here together. And the last thing we do, as we say most weeks, is we eat together, representing this new creation that is in Christ this new freedom that we have. Sin is no longer our master. Ahab and Baal and Jezebel are no longer our uh, overlords. We're no longer in bondage to sin as Israel was in bondage to Egypt and to Pharaoh. Why? Because Jesus has shown up and he has brought redemption and he is bringing about a new creation. So we have the God's spirit hovering over the waters in creation God's spirit hovering over Israel in the creation of God's people in the Exodus. 
We have Elijah hovering over the dead child to bring him back from the dead. We have Elijah hovering over the earth to bring it back to life. And we have the Spirit of God that comes down in Pentecost and hovers over the people like a flame of fire to bring life out of death. Psalm 104 is a divine commentary, uh, if you would, on the creation week. We read part of it for our call to worship. And I, I wouldn't even be surprised if Elijah, when he heard about the, the cloud hovering over the water, if he was thinking of verse 30 of Psalm 104, which says this, when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. This is what God does. He renews things. He renews us. He brings life out of death. You know, we, we lament death as we should but we don't get a resurrection without first going through a death. And that's true not only physically of our lives, but that's true of our habits and our relationships and sin as well. Put to death the deeds of the flesh so that you might live. We get no resurrection without death. And this is the hope that we find in this story and throughout the Bible. So let's move on. Verse 45 and 46, it says this. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind. And there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So things start to get a little risky, right? The cloud comes, and then pretty quickly, the sky begins to turn black. And there begins to be thunder and great rain and Elijah tells the servant, go tell Ahab he has to go now because it's about 11 miles from Carmel to Jezreel. So Ahab, go. So he gets in his chariot and he begins. And then the hand of the Lord comes on Elijah and an Olympic runner type fashion. He girds up his loins, ties up his robe, and runs 11 miles ahead of the chariot. This is, this is a great story, for one, because I would love to see that actually happen. Uh, God's hand was on Elijah. This is a supernatural act. God's hand was on Elijah, and he picks him up, and he causes him to run faster than a chariot, out, outrunning this, uh, this, this chariot and outrunning the, the rain and the storm as well. So we'd have to ask, what, why, why is this in here? Why is it that uh, God causes Elijah to run ahead of the chariot? Well, first thought, it might be because of Elijah's nice camel hair outfit that he has, and the rain will really mess that up. No, that, that's not it. I mean, it, m maybe it's because Elijah will get stuck in a mudslide on Mount Carmel if he does not get out of there quickly. Maybe it's because Elijah just doesn't like the rain, and he just runs and prays, God, get me there. I don't want to be a part of this. The real reason is, again, a symbolic message for us, that as the king is riding back into his kingdom, it's a new day for Israel, and the king will follow the word of the Lord. The king will follow God's commands, which come through the mouths of the prophet. So for Elijah to run ahead of Ahab, what he's doing is representing that it is a new day. No longer will we follow the Baals, but the king is now going to follow the words of the Lord. And he runs ahead and goes before the king, announcing that the king is coming. And Ahab ought to follow the words of the Lord. This, this symbolism is important, but it's also kind of discouraging because how long does this actually last? How long will Ahab say, okay, it's a new day. I will follow Yahweh. I will follow the words of the Lord as represented by the prophets. Well, in the first creation, it didn't take very long before Adam and Eve messed things up disobeying God, being deceived, eating of the fruit. And this new creation that God had made for his people to, to dwell in, to play in, to have fun, and, and spread his glory goes sideways pretty quickly. Again, even with the flood and that creation, right, it didn't take long before sin festers and they don't even enjoy the renewed creation before you have curses handed out upon Noah's children. I also see this in, in the creation of God's people in the Exodus. As soon as they come through the waters, they praise God. It's a new day. And then what happens? They begin to grumble. They begin to complain. 
They even get to the point where they want to see Moses dead. This is even before they get to Sinai. It doesn't take long for sin to enter in and mess up something that's good. And so in this story, it doesn't take long. In fact, it happens right away. Look at verse 1 of chapter 19. Ahab gets back, and he tells his beloved wife, Jezebel, all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. This is not the news Jezebel was hoping for. Jezebel really did not like Elijah, like really despised him, wanted to see him dead. It was Elijah that actually embarrassed her, as she's the one that brought the god of Baal into Egypt, and it doesn't rain for three and a half years. And this is what Baal's specialty was, to provide rain. Jezebel is not happy. After all, the prophets of Baal were her friends. She brought them from Sidon to Israel. We see that uh, they were her people. In fact, they even ate at her table. She knew these men well. She loved the prophets of Baal. Baal was her god. She was the one who, who brought Baal worship into Israel. So for Ahab to come back and say, Jezebel, all the prophets are dead. Baal was defeated. Jezebel is not one to quickly bend the knee to Yahweh, repent, and be brought into the covenant, be a part of the new creation. In fact, she represents the old order. She represents slavery to sin. She represents the hard-heartedness that the earth was likewise hard-hearted. She represents all of that. And instead of repenting, this is what she does. She sends a message to Elijah. Verse 2, it says this, Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And by the life of one of them, she's talking about the prophets that are in little pieces in the valley. She's saying, may God, may Baal, do to me if I don't do to you what you did to my prophets by this time tomorrow. Jezebel is a very influential woman. She's not getting this message out without the blessing for one of her, of her husband, the king. So when she speaks, it's, she speaks for him as well. And when they speak, they speak for Israel as a whole. Just like that, Israel turns from this covenant renewal, this new day. God, you did it again. The cloud over the water, new creation. You washed us. You made us right you brought us into relationship. We feasted and dined with you. And right away, they turn their back on Yahweh and begin to follow the Baals again. So how does Elijah respond to this? Verse 3 it says, Then he was afraid, and he rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, this verse has always been problematic for me. <laughs> in the story of Elijah, you have this great man of God who, who stands face-to-face, toe-to-toe with 450 prophets of Baal with his life on the line. You have this man who, who stood up to King Ahab and made Ahab quiver in his shoes like a little boy standing before a great man of God. You have Elijah, this, this great and powerful man of God, and now this note comes to him through a messenger from the queen saying, I'm going to kill you tomorrow, and now he's greatly afraid? See, the, the, as I've read through the, the story of Elijah, oftentimes I say, well, this doesn't sound like Elijah. Elijah is the type of guy that laughs in the face of fear, right? I mean, he is this bold and courageous man. He's not, why is he afraid of Jezebel? He stood up to her and to Ahab once before. He brought fire down from heaven he shut up the heavens. Well, the Spirit did it through him. Why is he now afraid of this? You know, I think one of the greatest blessings that we have in North America is how many, or English-speaking languages, how many translations of the Bible we have. It is truly a blessing. And most of the, bi most of the translations we have are made up of really incredible Bible scholars, men and women who love God and are devoted to the word of God. And they are men and women that have, they will forget far more than I'll ever learn in my life. All right? I mean, these people are of high intellect and God uses them to do work in Hebrew and Greek. Yet, I think this translation is awful. 
this verse is not translated well. And, and I'll tell you why. The Hebrew word for afraid is ra'ah, okay, ra'ah. And it is used 1,300 times in the Old Testament. And not one time is it translated afraid or fear or fearful. In fact, it has nothing to do with fear. So when they translate this word, raha, to afraid, Elijah was afraid and then therefore ran for his life, which is also not the best. Uh, it, it is a translation that actually comes from the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, and that word is fear. So they chose to use the Greek as opposed to the Hebrew. But what the Hebrew actually means, raha, means to look around or to understand. All right? It means to look around or to understand. So the translators, they make choices. Do we use this manuscript or this manuscript and so on? Uh, and they decided to use the, the Greek one, which is this idea of fear. Right? But in the Hebrew, it means to look around or to understand. And this actually makes perfect sense within the context and the story of Elijah. Elijah gets this message, and what he does, he looks around at Israel. He tries to understand what's happening. And he says, they're gone. They're lost. I'm leaving. And when God takes a prophet from his people, that is also, once again, judgment upon the people. So Elijah looks around. He gets this message. He goes, they're not going to follow him. They're not going to follow Yahweh. It would be like us looking around a church, right, and saying, what do you value? What are the things that are important to you? If, if, your, if your values line up with the values of God, if your ethics, your morals, if your object of worship is the same object of worship that we find in the scriptures, that'd be like observing a church and saying, okay, this is, this is a good place. But if you go to a church and you, you observe, you look around, and you see that the people do not follow God with their actions, the words that are being spoken are not faithful to the scriptures, if, if, if the lifestyles are in opposition to the way God has called his people to live, you would look around and you would understand and say, you know, I, I can't be here. I'm not going to worship here. I'm not going to identify with these people. And you would leave. Right? And this is essentially what Elijah does with Israel. He looks around and says, they're corrupt. They've fallen away again. They, they, they don't want to be faithful to Yahweh. They'd rather go after the Baals. So he walks away. And then it goes on, and we see that not only does he walk, or does he look around and observe, it then says, then he ran for his life. And this word literally means he walked away. Wasn't running out of fear, but he looked around, he observed, and says, all right, it's time for me to leave. And by him leaving, judgment then comes upon Israel. The story goes on in verse 4 says this, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So he left his, his servant, and he goes another day's journey into the wilderness. And he came, and he sat down under a broom tree and asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Elijah, he needed to be alone. He left his servant, and he continues to walk. And he prays to God, not out of fear, like, God, I'm so afraid. Why don't you take me so Jezebel won't, right? That, that's not what's going on in his mind. He saw the heart of Israel, how they have turned once again from Yahweh, and he walks away, and he cries out to God and says, God, I did everything that I could. I, I did everything I could. I'm done. Just take my life. I'm no better than my fathers, those who came before me, those men and women who had called Israel to repent, whether it be King David or the judges or, or Abraham or Moses. It, it goes all the way back. The people of God have constantly struggled with worshiping God, right? They're, they're constantly being pulled away by temptations. And Elijah, or Elijah finally says, God, it's enough. I'm no better than my fathers. I have not succeeded. Clearly, I'm done. I'm done. I, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I think we could identify with Elijah at this moment. I mean, th th there are times in our life where it's like, all right, God, we may not actually say this, but this is how we live, right? God, I'm going, I'm going to go to church every week. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to be a faithful husband, a loving wife. I'm going to raise kids. I'm going to 
I'm going to go to work faithfully. I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to give of my finances and my time to you. And then all of a sudden, something horribly drastic happens. All right? Your child gets sick. You get scammed out of thousands of dollars. You get to the place where uh, you find out that your spouse is unfaithful or there's addiction involved that's been hidden. And you can kind of sit down and say, God, I- I've tried. I-, I-, I tried everything. I've tried to live faithful to you. You know, Elijah's saying, God, I-, I was in exile for three and a half years. I was wandering around in a desert. You fed me by dirty birds and a widow. I came back. I risked my life. It was a good day. I thought they repented, but now they're going back to their old ways. We could say the same thing. God, I've, I've done all of this for you. I've sacrificed my time and my effort, and now you send me, uh, or you make it feel like it's all not worth it. You make me feel like, uh, like all my efforts were in vain, as if you don't respect or honor what I've done for you, God. All right, we allow grief to set in. Perhaps we have fear of what tomorrow will bring, anger with God or anger with other people, anger with situations. Say, God, I've I've lived faithfully, and now I've had it. I want to walk away. You know, one of the beautiful truths about the gospel is that when Christ came in the ultimate uh, new creation, the ultimate redemption that we have in Christ, is that he keeps his people close. And he has constructed a new covenant. Jeremiah prophesies about this, and so does Ezekiel, saying, Israel, one day, don't worry, there will, be, there will be a new covenant, and I will put my spirit within you, and you will love me, and you will follow me, and I love you, and I will be faithful to you, and there is this new covenant that is made in Christ's blood that is unable to be broken and unable to be shaken. So for us, when we have those struggles, when when things happen that cause us to doubt God, what we do have is this covenantal bond with God that he will not let us go. A covenant is like this. I mean, I think one of the best ways to understand it is is that. It's a bond between God and his people. And though we may feel fearful or sorrowful or we feel like life is chaotic and we can't get any peace, or feel angry, whatever it may be, unlike Israel, who is now, again, unfaithful to the covenant, we can rely on the promises of God. And we can rely on the truth of the gospel. And though we may feel like we are in despair, what we do know with absolute certainty is that Jesus is in the midst of that chaos with us. <laughs> right? He, he, hasn't, he hasn't exiled us and sent us out into curses because of unfaithfulness, but rather he is near to us. He is with us. So back at verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree and asked that he might die, saying, it is enough now. O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Reading on, God does not leave him in despair. He does not leave Elijah in this place. Verse 5, and he lay down and slept under the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said, arise and eat. Arise and eat. And he looked and beheld, there was at his head a cake baked on a hot stone and jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. Now this is fascinating because in this moment of despair, Elijah wants his life to be over. He wants to be done. The struggle is too much. And in this moment of despair, God's provision shows up in a supernatural way. See, in in the same way that we are bound to Christ and he is bound to us and he will not leave us or forsake us even in those difficult times, that he is present with us even when times are out of control. In the same way, God is present with Elijah. Even when everybody else has left, he is present there and he sustains Elijah in this wilderness. Verse 7, and the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat, 
for the journey is too great for you. You see, the angel of the Lord knew Elijah's limitations. He knew that uh, Elijah can't do this journey on his own. He, he knows that you do feel like dying. He is sympathetic to, to the pain that Elijah is in. He goes, this journey that you're about to embark upon is too great for you without my sustaining power. My friends, this week is too great for you without God's sustaining power. Right? I mean, th this day is too great for you without God's sustaining power. Without his presence and his power in the midst of difficulties, we will be like Elijah each and every day. And shame on us if we don't recognize his sustaining grace to us each and every day. This is why we should be praising him when we rise up in the morning. We should be praising him as we walk about the way. And we should be praising him when we sit down and eat. We should be praising him when we lay down to sleep because his sustaining power is with us all the time. Even in the moments where it feels like he is so far away, like the, like the angel feeding Elijah, God's presence is with us. This journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank, again, a, a symbol of being in right relationship with the Father. Elijah is, at, even if Israel is not. He ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. So now, Elijah, like rebellious Israel before, is about to embark upon a journey toward a destination uh, that Israel had traveled before. It's almost as if God is saying, Elijah, you know what? Let, let's, let's, let's run this back again. And Elijah travels 40 days and 40 nights to the Mount Horeb, which is the mount of God, which is Mount Sinai. God is bringing Elijah to Mount Sinai where Israel came and God spoke to Moses out of the cloud and gave Moses the covenant and told Moses, this is how you are to live and had a conversation with Moses for 40 days and 40 nights on how to build the tabernacle and gave him instructions on how to worship and what the sacrifices will be like. He, he gave him all of this instruction at the same place that Elijah is now journeying to. God plans to have a talk with his faithful yet discouraged prophet. As God supernaturally fed and sustained Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, so he will, or has, supernaturally fed and will sustain Elijah in this 40-day journey. And when he arrives at Mount Sinai, God will tell Elijah of his plans and how he will handle rebellious Israel. So this is, this is where Elijah comes to the mountain of God, comes to Mount Sinai, and has a conversation with God, which we'll get into next, next week, which is the story of the still small voice. And it's basically Elijah crying out to God, saying, hey, God, I still want to die. And God's saying, hold on, we, I, I, I'm still in charge. I've got you, Elijah. We've got plans. We have uh, a new day that is coming. And ultimately foreshadowing the greatest day when the Messiah comes and makes all things right. This is great hope for us that God met Elijah in that dark moment and sustains him. This is great hope for us that even a rebellious, a, a rebellious nation like Israel with a rebellious king and a rebellious queen, that God's grace overflowed and brought them back into a right relationship, that new creation, this new day. And this is the hope that we have, that Christ has done all of that for us and will continue to sustain us and continue to bring us back. And we will continue to be renewed together, which we are about to do at communion. Let me pray.